Public activist and a humble spiritualist. Sri Manikam Ramaswamy was a multifaceted personality, Ramu, as he was fondly known to his countless friends and admirers, touched innumerable lives and made lasting contributions to the many institutions he was associated with. He was the scion of the well-known industrialist family of the late Karamutu Tyagarajan Chetiyar, the doing of South Indian textile industry. A graduate in mechanical engineering from IIT Madras, Sri Ramaswamy was awarded the gold medal for outstanding scholastic performance. As an industrialist, he was most modern in his outlook and constantly strived to be in the forefront of technology at Lloyd Textiles Mills, which he headed. The philanthropic educational institutions he was actively involved, such as Tyagaraja Model Higher Secondary School, Tyagaraja College of Preceptors and Tyagaraja School of Management all emphasize on holistic development of students and affordability. A powerful writer and frequent contributor to financial dailies, Sri Ramaswamy spoke unhesitatingly on trade, economic and public policies from the perspective of a concerned and responsible citizen rather than of a businessman. He passionately advocated and practice sustainability. He painstakingly created world and green in Bayern locales, installed energy and water saving facilities, and invested in renewable energy and recycling infrastructure in the industrial units and institutions under his care. In addition to being a committed environmentalist, he was an avid agriculturalist. He personally designed and installed special goshalas in all his mills creating the most humane and comfortable environment for cows and supplying his employees with fresh organic milk. He was keenly involved in organic farming of paddy and vegetables and in promoting the interests of cotton farmers. He played an active role in industry bodies such as CII, SIMA and Textile Export Promotion Council, Chambers of Commerce in various capacities and address large audiences and policy issues. He worked tirelessly for resolving the Tamil Nadu industrial power crisis of 2008-2012 and played a pivotal role in bringing about favorable export and renewable energy policies that benefited the Indian textile industry. He also successfully campaigned for restructuring excise duty on cotton yarn and the removal of the exemption given to certain segments so as to create a level playing field. He championed assiduously for the welfare of handloom weavers to see that several measures were passed to support their livelihood and help them increase their earnings. He was also active on the international stage and served as honorary consul to the Republic of Maldives where he helped with post-tsunami relief and to Federal Republic Ethiopia where he worked tirelessly to help develop the then-fledged textile industry. In short, 
Sri Ramaswamy was a rare example of the trusteeship that Mahatma Gandhi envisioned and championed. மாசிலாமாணிக்கமாய் வாழ்ந்தவரை நினைந்திருப்போம் மாசிலாம் மாணிக்கமாய் வாழ்ந்தவரை நினைந்திருப்போம் மற்றவரை உயர்த்திடவே நினைத்தவர்க்கு கரம் குவிப்போம் மற்றவரை உயர்த்திடவே நினைத்தவர்க்கு கரம் குவிப்போம் அவர் நடந்த அடிச்சுவட்டில் நாமும் தடம் பதிப்போம் ஆதவனின் ஒளியாய் என்றும் வழி நடத்த வேண்டும் ஆதவனின் ஒளியாய் நம்மை வழி நடத்த வேண்டுவோம் நம்மை வழி நடத்த Shri B.T. Bangera, Chairman, Board of Governors of TSM and Managing Director, Hitech Array Limited to deliver the welcome address. Uh, good, mo- good, good morning, one and all. Um, November 20th is a very special day for all of us being the birthday of uh, Ramu. And uh, on this day, every year, we hold uh, Manika Ramaswami uh, Memorial Lecture. This is the third year we are holding. So, first of all, let me... Uh, extend a warm welcome to our today's speaker, Subramanyam Ramadurai. We have been a little apprehensive while inviting him whether he will be able to make out because of his busy schedule. To our surprise, he has readily agreed and come out with the subject which is uh, very close to the heart of uh, Ramu. Although he is not physically available here today, he must be watching it, witnessing it from somewhere. Uh, let me also uh, welcome K. Venugopal, Director, Kasturi and Sons Limited, Publishers of the Hindu and the Business Line. Um, he is going to talk about uh, his reminiscences because he has been working with him very closely. Um, I will, would like to expand, um, extend welcome to um, Ramu's family. Mrs. Walli Ramaswamy and uh, Ms. Vishala and other family members of the, um, his family. And uh, let me also extend a warm welcome to entire loyal textile family, director, management, members of the management and staff. And also let me extend a warm welcome to TSM, director, Murali Sambasim, faculty members, staff and students. And uh, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all his friends uh, from the industry and various institutions. And uh, uh, let me extend a welcome to all the invitees. Uh, today's topic is a very interesting topic which uh, uh, Sri Ramadara has selected. Uh, climatic change and uh, ecological sustainability, which is a subject which is going to such is the lives of each and every one who is living in this uh, planet. They say that we are living in a borrowed times from our uh, successors, future generations. So it is the beauty of every human being to uh, it touches. And this is a subject which has been very close to Ram. And I am very happy this subject has been selected and uh, all of us are going to get benefited from this. And, um, 
Of course, there will be a small video introducing the speaker. But Mr. Ram Surai was the he is a CEO, chairman of this Tata Institute of Social Science, and he has been working for about 25 years in TC as Tata Consulting Services. Retired as a CEO, having worked for many years as CEO, and. Um, Venugopal is going to talk about uh, his reminiscences because he has been working closely and uh, in various uh, platforms. And uh, I have seen them working in the CII southern region of life for a long time on various uh, topics and uh, they have been very close to each other. And when, he, when I talk about reminiscences, I remember one incident because I have to mention this also is a repetition. Uh, Ramu has touched the lives of almost all people. And uh, one of the instances I will tell you so that it will explain what is this, uh, this person. Uh, about eight years back, one carpenter along with the student came to the, his son came to the institute for admission. And uh, looking at the infrastructure and uh, premises and all, campus, uh, they thought uh, this is not the place for us and they were to go back. Still, the student uh, appeared for the interview and he got selected. Still, while going back, they were telling, we will not come back because this is not meant for us. We can't afford it. This news went to Ramu and he called for the papers and called the people. Within 10 minutes, he discussed and decided that this boy will be given two years scholarship and uh, he will study here free. And uh, interestingly, at the end of two years, this boy got a Ramas, Manikam Ramaswami gold medal and as the best student of the institute. That's how he has touched the lives of various people and uh, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Venu Gopal will have a lot of reminiscences about him. So with this, I have been given three minutes. With these few words, uh, I once again welcome everyone who is participating today and looking forward to the uh, very interesting memorial lecture by Ram. Thank you very much. I have pleasure introducing Sri K. Venugopal <coughs> to this August gathering. Sri K. Venugopal was born on August 18, 1957. He has completed MA Economics from Loyola College, Madras in 1979 and MS in Journalism from University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign in 1980. Sri Venugopal started his career as a staff reporter in the Hindu and in his tenure from 1980 to 2011 has held various responsibilities like assistant editor of the Hindu, executive editor of Business Line, a business newspaper he helped launch in 1994 and joined editor of Business Line. From 2011, he is the director of Kasturi and Sons Limited, publishers of the Hindu Business Line, the August newspaper in India. CK Venugopal is also director of Chennai International Center. He was on the CII Southern Regional Council along with Sri Manikam Ramaswamy for several years, benefiting from Sri Ramaswamy's common sense approach on vital issues facing the industry. I invite Sri Venugopal to reflect on the moments and the memories shared with Sri Manikam Ramaswamy. Thank you. And Mr. Ramadurai, Ms. Bali Ramaswamy. Mr. Bangera, Mr. Sambasivan, and my friends Lakshmi Narayan, Madhavan Nambiar, and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first uh, thank Valli for inviting me to speak to all of you today. I have been to your beautiful campus at TSM many a time and would have loved to be there today too. But we must make do with this virtual meeting. As you all know, with COVID around, these are not normal times and we have to adapt. 
It was a little more than three years ago, September 30th, uh, 2017, to be precise. I spent a whole evening that day traveling with Manikam Ramaswamy, or Ramu as we called him, to the inaugural of uh, Arvind High Eye Hospital in Chennai. Ramu was a great admirer, friend, and supporter of Arvind Hospitals and its promoter, Mr. Srinivasan. The two shared the same ethical values that all of us merely aspire to have. Ramu was chatting so amiably as usual with me about the business and the economy. He even spoke about the impending dental procedure that was to turn so tragically fatal a couple of days later. Death snatched him prematurely. I still cannot believe it has happened to one of the nicest human beings I've known. Yet I know such great human beings do not disappear from our midst. Their imprint lives on. What I intend to do today is to spell out what I've found in his exemplary life. A number of learnings that I think will enrich mine as well as that of all of you. Learnings about being passionate in all that you do, being compassionate about the underprivileged, being ethical in the way you conduct your business, as well as every part of your life, being disciplined in eating and exercising, and above all, reposing full faith in the divine. Let me start with this passion. One evening, uh, that was about a fortnight before his demise, it was about 10 p.m., I had a call from Ramu that, Venu, what do you think of the bullet train idea? It was then the, that the government had announced the idea of launching a high-speed link between Mumbai and Ahmedabad. Ramu said, why should we spend money on such luxuries when basic stuff is still not available to all of us? That question started what turned out to be a 42-minute call. I know these numbers because I looked through my phone records. That argument was passionately Ramu's. Usually I would find myself on the same side of the argument as, as he, but this time I was, I was on the other side, but I found little space and time to put across my feeble opposition to his critique of the high-speed rail project. I got perhaps five minutes out of the 42. Now, it's very clear that passion in whatever he does was Ramu's hallmark. He was passionate about making our country do well. All of us wish for that, but Ramu had clear, radical, but very practical ideas of how that could be done. Here's one example of what he would say. Why does the government load taxes and protectionist duties on the cement industry? By doing so, the government has only made the cost of buildings far too high and made our economy as a whole uncompetitive and homes unaffordable for, for people. He was spot on. He was passionate about his own textile industry. He was very clear what the government should do to enlarge the export market for, for the industry. I remember at one business line breakfast meeting in 2017 with Ms. Nirmala Sitaraman, who was then the Commerce Minister and now the Finance Minister. He wanted her to negotiate a level playing field in terms of tariff for India vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh and Vietnam, the two countries that were 
competing with India in the global market. He was there not to beg for favors from the minister, but demand what was equitable and fair. He said that measure could provide India several billion dollars of exports with the potential to create employment for hundreds of thousands. It's also very clear what the industry did not need. Doles and subsidies from the government, which many of his friends were asking. And uh, Ramo, I, I, I know, was particularly severe on those in his industry who unabashedly went seeking favors from the government. Ramo was compassionate about the welfare of the community around him, especially the less privileged. And we heard Mr. Bangera tell a story that is something that one would only expect of Ramu. Once he had his daughter Vishala to do a study of women employees at Loyal Textiles and their life at home so that he could understand what it took to bring them to work regularly. What Vishala discovered was revealing. He said, give them simple home gadgets that would make their household chores easier, arrange for their husbands to see the factory so that the women could win the respect of their husbands, and so on. Ramu was greatly excited. And I dare say he was even more proud that his daughter had provided a solution. Ethics was something Ramu saw in capital letters. Corruption, he would never compromise on. He fought hard against those who sought bribes. And I know he would never pay his way through. He would choose to let his business endure delays and hardship, even as his competitors in the industry chose the easier way out. Sustainability was a buzzword then in his time as it is now. The only difference is Ramu chose to act on it rather than merely talk about it. As I used to come to your campus from the airport, I could always see barren landscape on either side of the road. Ramu had different ideas for what his campus ought to be. Today, if it is leafy and green, it is because of his determination to make this a green campus. He was a great investor in wind energy and used to monitor very closely indeed on a daily basis, the output from his various wind turbines. For him, investment in green energy was not a fad, not something to show off to the world. He put his money where his mouth was because he knew it would be sustainable business as well. And how right he was. Wind and solar power today are cheaper than thermal power. Discipline seemed to flow out of his DNA. He was pretty strict about what he ate and very regular about exercise and fitness. He was a great believer in the divine and drew immense strength from that faith. His contributions to temples were substantial, but were done without fanfare, which was typically Ramu. He was passionate about his family and so proud of Barli and Vashala. He was lavish in encouraging them. Barli in her wonderful promotion of the arts and culture and Vishala in preparing her to succeed him. The latter was his great wish. I'm sure Vishala will fulfill that in a way that will make Ramu happy. On a personal note, I lost a great friend three years ago. 
It was a defining friendship for neither of us needed a personal favor from the other. I think we both appreciated the intellectual stimulation our conversations provided us. I shall surely miss those conversations. I learned a lot from him and his way of approaching the world. I shall miss him. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. I'm honored to introduce Sri Subramanian Ramadurai. Sri Ramadurai was in public service from February 2011 to October 2016. During his tenure as the chairman of National Skill Development Agency and the National Skill Development Corporation, his approach was to standardize the skilling effort, ensure quality and commonality of outcomes by leveraging technology, and create an inclusive environment to cooperate, collaborate, and coexist. He strongly believed that empowering the youth with the right skills can define the future of the country. Sri Ramadurai is currently the chairman of the advisory board at Tata Strive, which is the Tata Group's CSR skill development initiative that aims to address the pressing national need of skilling youth for employment, entrepreneurship, and community enterprise. He is also the chairman of Tata Technologies Limited, and additionally serves as an independent director on the boards of Peramal Enterprises Limited and DSP Investment Managers. In March 2016. He retired as the chairman of the Bombay Stock Exchange after having served on their board for a period of 6 years. Sri Ramadurai took over as the CEO of Tata Consultancy Services in 1996 when the company's revenues were at 155 million dollars and since then led the company through some of its most exciting phases including its going public in 2004. In October 2009, he retired as the CEO, leaving a $6 billion global IT services company to his successor. He was then appointed as the vice chairman and retired in October 2014 after an association of over four decades with the company. Given his keen passion to work for the social sector and community initiatives, he also serves as the chairman on the Council of Management at the National Institute of Advanced Studies and the chairperson of the governing board at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. He is also the president of the Society for Rehabilitation of Crippled Children, which built a super specialty children's hospital in Mumbai. Sri Ramadurai is the chairperson of the Public Health Foundation of India that has been working over the years to build public health capacity across several domains and strengthening health systems in central and state governments. He is also the chairman of the Access Back Foundation that was formed in 2006 with the vision to carry out the corporate social responsibility initiatives of Access Bank. He is keenly involved with the foundation and their work as they focus on fostering sustainable livelihoods. Sri Ramadurai was invited to chair the India chapter of the British Asian Trust that is a diaspora led organization founded by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales and a group of British Asian business leaders that play a key role in building the social finance market in South Asia and more specifically in India. Sri Ramadurai and his wife Mala created the Andesha Trust in 2014. Health camps, tailoring classes and IT skills training for students have been implemented. This trust collaborates actively with other NGOs and charitable organizations on the ground to work in the areas of education, skills and healthcare. In recognition of his commitment and dedication to the IT industry, he was awarded the Padma Bhushan, India's third highest civilian honor in January 2006. In April 2009 he was awarded the Commander of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II for his contribution to the Indo-British economic relations. In 2016 he was also awarded the Economic Times Lifetime Achievement Award for his glorious contribution to Tata Consultancy Services. His academic credentials include a bachelor's degree in physics from Delhi University, a bachelor of engineering degree in electronics and telecommunications from the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore and a master's degree in computer science from the University of California. In 1993, Sri Ramadurai attended the Sloan School of Management's highly acclaimed Senior Executive Development Program. 
Sri Ramadurai is a well-recognized global leader and technocrat who has participated in the Indian IT journey from a mere idea in 1960s to a mature industry today. He captured this exciting journey in a wonderfully personalized book titled The TCS Story and Beyond, which was published in 2011 and remained on top of the charts for several months. Among his many interests, Sri Ramadurai is also passionate about photography and Indian classical music. I invite Sri Ramadurai to deliver Sri Manikam Ramaswamy Memorial Lecture on Climate Change and Ecological Sustainability. Thank you so much, Mr. B.T. Bangera, Chairman of the Board of Governors, Tyagaraja School of Management, Sri Murali Sambasivan, Director, TSM, Sri Lakshmi Narayanan, former Vice Chairman Cognizant, Sri Kasturi Venugopal, Director, Kasturi and Sons Limited, all the other Board of Governors, Mrs. Valli Ramaswamy, wife of late Sri Manikam Ramaswamy, daughter, Ms. Vishala Ramaswamy, distinguished guests, faculty members, students, alumni, and other bodies. A very, very good morning to all of you. I think what uh, Vernu articulated about Manikam as a true human being and some of the personal experiences and the learnings in the area of passionate, compassionate, ethical values, discipline, and reposing, reposing full faith in the divine with examples is a lesson for all of us, not only for Poinu having experienced and talked about it. I hope that you and your family members are all in good health and safe during this pandemic. And it's an honor for me to deliver Sri Manikam Ramaswamy Memorial Lecture that is hosted by the Tyagaraja School of Management. Essentially, this pandemic has taught all of us how to operate in these difficult times and how to use the digital medium to the fullest. Be it buying groceries and or essentials, taking new courses online, most importantly for all of you students, the seamless transition from classroom environment to studying how in the virtual world we can do it without hampering your continuous education. The virtual world, while has its own setbacks, essentially digital fatigue and excessive hours of screen time. But this has shown us a new and unthinkable way of life going forward in the wake of the pandemic. I hope the global collaboration with regard to the vaccine research, the vaccine coming into the market, which is available in an affordable manner to all of humanity will soon be realized. And the key point I made is has to be affordable and available to every single citizen in this planet in a time which is almost the same as anywhere in any developed part of the world. Now, having seen the video on Sri Manikam Ramaswamy, having read about a little bit, read about him a little bit, he was truly a multifaceted personality. He was an upright industrialist a passionate educationist, a caring humanist, a spirited public activist, and a humble spiritualist. I think he was far ahead of his times in terms of being the most modern in his outlook and constantly strived to be at the forefront of technology, the organization which he headed. The more importantly, the philanthropic educational institutions he was actively involved always emphasized on the holistic development of students and affordability. He was a powerful writer and a frequent contributor to the financial dailies. He also spoke unhesitatingly on trade, economic, and public policies, 
more importantly from the perspective of a concerned and responsible citizen rather than that of a businessman he passionately advocated and practiced sustainability which we have also touched upon he painstakingly created wood and green cover in barren locales installed energy and water saving facilities and of course invested in renewable energy and recycling infrastructure in the industrial units and institutions under his care thus taking care of the harms of climate change in addition to being a committed environmentalist he was also like it was mentioned an avid agriculturalist he personally designed and installed special goshalas which is also mentioned and he was keenly involved in organic farming of paddy and vegetables and was promoting the interests of cotton farmers he was instrumental in resolving the tamil nadu industrial power crisis of 2008 to 2012 and played a pivotal part in bringing about a favorable uh, export and renewable energy policies that benefited the indian textile industry very well in short sri manikam ramaswami was a rare example of a true leader who envisioned and championed his visionary ideals as well as the genuinely cared he cared for the environment and the society so the topic that's why i chose after having read about him the climate change and the pandemic and the role of youth and we want to how we want to build a future for all of us with youth being at the center stage and the climate change and pandemic teaching us a lot of lessons what the pandemic has shown us is the real meaning of global health crisis shortage of hospital beds testing facility lack of jobs livelihood people dying for all there but this pandemic has also taught us to manage in these difficult times we have learned how to be frugal yet live happily how to be less social and less yet maintain our social relations and catch up with friends families the corona virus has shaken the nature of work to its core while many are still anxiously awaiting a return to normal what is normal after the pandemic is likely to look very different from what we were used to before it began i think last evening we had a talk by dr sabyasaji mukherjee who is the director general of the chatrapati shivaji maharaj vastru sangrahalay mumbai for the kalachetra foundation as part of the world heritage week he exactly articulated how the pandemic was not prepared for a disaster in the arts and culture of this country the kind of unemployment the kind of challenges the financial management has created and more importantly how he was addressing at the museum along with his colleagues along with the participation of the youth to address an address not for today but address for the future so that the institution stay strong since pandemics are there to be there off and on as some parts of the world start to lower restrictions leaders need to move from crisis response to thinking about the role of organization and the leadership in the long term and transition that will be gradual and uneven i think while many are now talking about the new normal this idea fails to capture the speed of the often nonlinear changes each of us each of us is experiencing in our lives as economies slowly recover the threat of renewed waves of corona virus remains uncertainty will stay with us for many months so it will be almost impossible to define what's normal what we need to think about is not a new normal but a new reality that is a new now for leaders the challenge of guiding people through uncertainty and into the new reality brings 
Timeless needs him to sharpen, sharper focus. Empathy and flexibility are important leadership qualities at any time. Because what we are seeing is during this pandemic and the implications of that, a lot of mental stress, loss of jobs, loss of livelihood, expenses, but without revenues or salary. When, in, when employees experience sudden and radical change, such as to need such as the need to work remotely in a high restricted workspaces for an extended period, these qualities are even more essential to keep teams cohesive, engaged, and motivated. I mean, even getting people to the workplace for essentials and absolute must has been a challenge. And that's what people and management are grappling with and addressing it, and there are a lot of lessons which must be captured for our future use. My dear students and all the participants, like I said, the world after COVID-19 is unlikely to return to the world that was. Many trends are already underway in the global economy that are being accelerated by the impact of the pandemic. This is especially true of transforming ourselves to adapt to the online mode, with the rise of digital behavior such as remote working and learning, telemedicine and delivery of services, other structural changes may also accelerate, including regionalization of the supply chains and the further explosion of cross-border data flows. Can we go to the next slide, please? Adhika? Yeah. I'm not sure how many of you have seen the recent Tata Consultancy Services advertisements. Well, here is a snapshot. I would like all of you to catch them on your YouTube sometime. The advertisements essentially capture the kind of work done by TCS in sectors like healthcare, banking, sustainability, with a concern for society and its well being at its core value. Thus, retaining the ethos of the Tata group that essentially believes in bringing back to the society multiple times. Today, we spend a lot of time choosing our careers, but how many of us really think if we will be able to transform the lives of the less fortunate given our career choices? And Sri Manikam Ramasamy was an example of that. The future of work has arrived faster along with its challenges, many of them potentially multiplied, such as income polarization, worker vulnerability, more gig work, and the need for workers to adopt to occupational transitions. This acceleration is the result not only of technological advances, but also of new considerations of health, safety, and labor markets will take time to recover and likely emerge changed. With the amplification of these trends, the realities of this crisis have triggered reconsideration of several beliefs. The possible effects on long-term choices for the economy, society, and the environment as well. These effects range from attitudes about efficiency versus resilience, the future of capitalism, effects of climate change, densification of economic activity and living. Our approach to problems that affect us all and thus call for global collective action, such as pandemics and climate change, to the role of government and institutions, and of course, the civil society. Pandemics and large scale outbreaks can claim millions of lives, disrupt societies, and devastate economies. COVID 19 will not be the last pandemic in our deeply interconnected world. And sadly, it will not be the worst. Two profoundly different possible futures are available to us. One in which we stick our heads in the sand as we have consistently done. and One where humanity takes the hard necessary steps to protect itself. In 2000, the 2019 Global Health Security Index, a comprehensive score to assess countries' ability to deal with health emergencies could not find even a single country 
adequately prepared for epidemics or pandemics india ranked 57th out of 195 countries pandemic preparedness typically involving surveillance risk reduction and capacity building demands considerable effort and commitment from the leaders as well as the youths like you all you are all the future of tomorrow so it is important to commit to prepare for such eventualities with the guidance of leaders of the civil society going to the next slide i want to briefly talk to you about the incredible work done by the public health foundation of india which is essentially a public private initiative that has collaboratively evolved through consultations with multiple constituencies including indian and international academia state and central governments multilateral and bilateral agencies and a number of civil society group phfi has risen to the occasion assisting advising and guiding the state governments corporates and communities on ways to tackle the pandemic as a unique organization of its kind in india its strength and expertise are only surpassed by its desire to serve fellow citizens despite its financial limitations as a non profit it has been agile enough to pivot its resources for grappling with covid crisis by conducting online workshops for healthcare professionals across the globe its faculty and staff are assisting state governments on the front line its researchers are busy in developing sustainable healthcare technologies covid-19 may only be the beginning of global pandemic a future scenario in which climate change may also play a role environmental damage can also make humans more susceptible to the effects of infectious diseases on a broader scale a combination of climate and geopolitical stresses or driving forced migrations displaced populations like those residing in refugee camps are also uniquely at risk from pandemic outbreak outbreaks because of living conditions that are incompatible with social distancing and a lack of access to testing or healthcare pandemic related lockdowns further exacerbate these challenges when disaster strikes it's human nature to worry only about meeting our most immediate needs and the fact that dramatically higher temperatures seem far off in the future does not make them any less of a problem the only way to avoid the worst possible climate outcomes is to accelerate our efforts now even as the world as the world works to stop the novel coronavirus and begin recovering from it we also need to act now to avoid a climate disaster by building and deploying innovations that will let us eliminate our greenhouse gas emissions you may have seen projections that because economic activity has slowed down so much the world will emit fewer greenhouse gases this year than the last year although these projections are certainly true their importance for the fight against climate change has been overstated analysts agree disagree about how much emissions will go down this year but the international agency energy agency puts the reduction around 8% which is roughly 4 billion tons of carbon in absolute terms this is a meaningful re uh, reduction and we would be great in sh in great shape if we could continue the rate of decrease every year in the united states according to data from the rhodium group the cost of reduction in greenhouse gases is approximately between $3200 and $5400 per ton of carbon in the european union it's roughly the same amount in other words covid-19 induced shutdown it's reducing emissions at a cost between 32 and 54 times the $100 per ton that economists consider a reasonable price countries across the world we need to develop detailed plans for compound risk preparedness taking account of regional differences in climate vulnerability the strength of existing health and social safety net systems and the outbreak trajectory in all cases governments and multinational institutions responding to covid-19 the climate crisis and their intersection must recognize that interventions and guidance must be tailored to the unique vulnerabilities needs and circumstances of the affected populations 
the climate adaptation community must develop a long term strategy for pandemic preparedness the strategy should also include more involvement of the civil society and the youth like you all more interdisciplinary cross sectoral risk assessments are needed including planning for natural disasters this assessment must explicitly consider spatial and temporal coincidence of physical hazards and health or socio economic risk factor interdependence between sectors the food like food energy water health etc on the climate resilience front many countries including india continue to address worsening impacts through the highly inadequate frame of disaster response this means that there is still far too little emphasis on pre disaster preparedness under the same agencies and resources that manage disasters are forced into attempting to build resilience to climate change on an ad hoc basis furthermore diversity of india and its social inequities has put poor people has put people of the economically vulnerable at a heightened risk in the face of both climate change and pandemics it has brought to the fore the existing gaps in healthcare and the social services and this must be addressed now spanning the eastern himalaya eastern nepal to the chinese china southwest mountains the eastern himalayas are both biodiversity and culturally rich as all of us know with over 400 indigenous communities and 12000 unique species today both communities and rare species are threatened by rampant deforestation and ecological degradation shrinking livelihoods and climate change balipara foundation where i am also deeply involved as climate change and nature are subjects close to my heart is one such organization that is working on a community based approach for the conservation through a proprietary concept according to a world bank study the world is headed down a dangerous path the disruption of the food system is possible within a decade as climate change undermines nations ability to feed themselves this is expedited by the onslaught of this pandemic rising urban populations are contributing to the expanded demand for food adding to nutrition shortages for the world's poor increased greenhouse gas emissions from land clearing will make farming more marginal in many regions especially in the developing nations the challenges from waste to warming spurred on by the growth growing population with the rising middle class hunger are leading us to a dangerous possibilities the economic picture related to the harmful effects of climate change is also stark the range of likely impacts from climate change and from covid-19 varies quite a bit depending on which economic model we use but the conclusion is unmistakable the next decade or two the economic damage caused by climate change is likely to be as bad as having a covid sized pandemic every 10 years and by the end of the century it will be much worse if the world remains on its current emissions path the point i want to make is that climate change is real and we need to address it otherwise we will go down a path of what just i articulated unless we learn the lessons of covid-19 we cannot approach climate change in a more informed manner and in turn be more prepared to save the lives and prevent the worst possible outcome the student and youth of today must play a crucial role in combating climate change it's now your responsibility as much to protect the planet in fighting the complex scientific problems and social quandaries presented by climate change youth education represent one of the most effective tools to combat the destructive potential of climate change and cultivate an international understanding among the members of the next generation climate change is a long term process that will impact an infinite right number of future generations this generation can be adept at spreading new habits and technologies they are also well placed to fight against climate change you are adaptable and can quickly make low carbon lifestyles and career choices as a part of your daily lives it is you who will determine the future direction of our planet but before you all get into business of doing you need to understand be aware of climate change and what needs to be done to prevent it 
So the World Economic Forum 2020 Global Risks Report dubbed nature and biodiversity loss as the biggest risk facing the economy today. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored just how urgent this has become. Trillions of dollars will be lost because of a single virus, which could have been prevented by investing no more than $31 billion in halting deforestation and transforming the wildlife trade. Ecological security through effective management of natural assets vital for protecting the three pillars of Indian economy, namely people, land and water. And let me share some important facts about India's ecology, which I believe you must be aware of. 60% of India's GDP is moderately to highly dependent on nature. 2019, nearly 3 million people lost their homes to floods. We lose rupees 52,000 crores annually because of flooding. Land degradation caused by forest loss is costing us over 197,000 crores annually. Our cities are water stressed. Nearly 60% of our groundwater is contaminated. And despite the increase in floods, water conflicts have doubled in the past decade. Nearly 2 million people lose their lives due to air pollution annually. And of that, 190,000 of these deaths are infants. Warming temperatures is broadening the range and prevalence of malaria and dengue. Forest clearances is increasing the risk of zoonotic disease transmission. The eastern Himalayan region is already warmed by 1.4 degrees Celsius, just 0.1 degree below the recommended limit set under the Paris Agreement. Experts around the world have warned that if we do not curb greenhouse gas emissions and start to adapt, climate change could seriously disrupt the world economy. Warmer temperatures, rise in sea levels, and extreme weather will damage property and critical infrastructure, impact human health and productivity, and negatively affect sectors such as agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and tourism. The demand for energy will increase as power generation becomes less reliable and water supplies will be stressed. Damage to other countries around the globe will also affect international business through disruption in trade and supply chains. As the world increasingly understands and accepts the reality of climate change and the impact of human actions on climate as well as natural resources like forests and water, the demand for professionals in the sector is bound to grow. This is also reflected in the increasing number of academic institutions providing courses in this area. Economics as a discipline is one of the most sought after in the sustainability debate for a variety of reasons. First, economics aligns closely with both public policy as well as human behavior, both of which are critical elements of the ecological sustainability debate. Second, economics provides an understanding of various analytical frameworks and tools that are employed for a deeper analysis and understanding how the choices of human society impact ecological security and what could be done to address these. These elements are most sought after in the sustainability space for a rewarding career. We need to curb the impact of climate change to be economically strong to become a $5 trillion economy as envisaged by our Honorable Prime Minister. Students, this is the time and moment to jump in and make a smart career choice. India's rich diversity of natural assets offers immense potential for employment in the fields of ecological sustainability, the natural capital economy, particularly in adaptation and mitigation for a net zero restoration economy. India has 140 million hectare restoration potential to create jobs in forestry and agroforestry uh, agro biodiversity, friendly agriculture while bringing communities on board. By investing $4 billion through Manrega can create additional 8 to 10 million jobs in forest restoration, protection and management, agroforestry, urban greening and sustainable timber and watershed rehabilitation. The renewable energy sector, a full transition to renewables, will create 3 million jobs by 2030. Coupled with a flexible microgrid, we can also drive rural entrepreneurship in the solar industry for hard to reach communities. By developing effective waste management systems, India has the potential to add $14 billion to the Indian economy by 2025 at an annual growth rate of 7%. 
So the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and blockchain can also drive efficiency across infrastructure, agriculture, waste, water, and natural resource management. These new technologies can also be used for effective energy distribution to meet demand and enhance energy security and efficiency. Jobs that have a direct positive impact on the planet traditionally involve renewable energy, electric transport, energy efficiency, or natural conservation. But right now, as many sectors, as more sectors transition to low carbon models, every job has a potential to become green. With unemployment rising due to the pandemic, there is no chance to reconfigure the jobs landscape as the environment will take center stage. So the corporate, government, civil society must essentially integrate ecology and economy together. India's shift to a green economy could also add 3 million jobs in the renewable energy sector alone by 2030, as estimated by the International Labour Organization. This sector created 47,000 new jobs in India in 2017, employing 432,000 people as per a July 2018 report. The number of jobs in India's green energy sector, excluding large hydropower projects, rose by 12% in just one year. Around 50% of the more than 500,000 new green jobs created globally in 2017 were in India, implying that more than 721,000 Indians are employed in the sector. Green jobs does appear to be the way forward for a nation with a high demographic dividend, high unemployment rate, and a degrading environment. The role of young people is critical in the field. One obvious route is through making a career in this field. In terms of the kind of job, this could be field-related jobs in which candidates work with the communities for either mitigation actions or adaptation actions. Could be with the think tank for research community or research community where analytical skills are required. Or could be the activism kind of jobs where candidates become part of institutions and efforts that demand accountability and foster action from governments and big corporations for addressing the issue of climate change. Apart from career choices, students can generally help by becoming conscious and aware citizens and who make energy efficient and sustainable choices in their lives. They could also engage by socializing critical messages related to sustainability through vibrant social media platforms and can also play a critical role as citizen scientists while working on non-environmental related jobs. Each one of you can be the drivers of change in this fight against climate change and ecological sustainability, innovating and leading the new way of green business to drive change, particularly in emissions reductions through renewables, innovating waste to energy, blockchain to flexible energy delivery, circular processes and manufacturing for some of important fields where you can delve into. Experimentation and research are also on to build and create local carbon capture and storage technology that can safely sequester carbon. Once you graduate and join a corporate or government or civil society, you can be the agents of change. You can push businesses and employers to incorporate natural capital accounting in their businesses and also adopt other environmentally sound practices like de zero deforestation pledges to drive business decisions which minimize negative impacts on natural capital and maximize positive impacts. You can also get involved with restoration programs, start restoration programs in cities as well as in rural areas, to restore natural biodiversity and terrestrial ecosystems like forests and wetlands. Planting trees scientifically is one of the most potent tools we have in the fight against climate change. We can also support existing afforestation program through volunteering and restore the planet or begin a greening program in your city backyard. You can also increase public accountability by raising your voice and creating awareness on the importance of India's commitments to the Paris Agreement, reducing emissions through charging, changing consumption and business practices. A lot of these programs have become an integral part of the culture, corporate culture now. They are soon to become students of life, and it's indeed a proud moment for each one of you. You are the ambassadors of this esteemed institution, so keep the flag flying high. We're working with honesty, integrity, 
and commitment. Great Sri Manikam Ramaswami, like everyone said, must continue to be an inspiration for each one of you as you choose your path in life. I would like to conclude the famous quote from our father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for the inspiring speech. Uh, we have a series of questions. Hope we'll be glad to take some questions. Oh. Yeah. So the first question is from Sita, Miss Sita. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, do you believe or do you think that you know the situation will resume to normal after once we get the vaccination for Corona? Uh, and I've been. Uh, I think um, it's a very good question. The new normal is going to be, in my opinion, digital, which means a combination of physical and digital. Whether it's the field of education, whether it's the field of health, whether it's the field of anything, I think the digital is going to play a critical role in our functioning. That puts a, puts a lot of stress on the kind of uh, infrastructure industry and how it's going to play out. A number of industries will have to reshape their future. But I think the new normal is going to be a combination of physical and digital. And the normal is not what we were used to in terms of whether it's consumption patterns, whether it's in terms of socializing the way we wanted to. And uh, that's the lesson that has been learned. But uh, that's the way I feel about it. But all of us want to socialize. All of us want to meet people. And once the vaccine comes and we are vaccinated, whether it is two doses or one dose, we don't know as yet. Some of the logistical challenges of the uh, low temperatures, transportation, logistics of the same are issues. So when is it going to be available? What is the process it's going to be available to the haves and have-nots? And how the distribution is going to take place is all the issues that need to be addressed. So even if a vaccine is discovered and the vaccine is manufactured, the availability and the logistics Logistics are going to pose a lot of questions and challenges. So when is it going to be available is anybody's guess, but the earliest attempt is the middle of next year. Thank you. Uh, the question is from Professor Shivakumar. Uh, will the work from home become a new normal as a strategic advantage for companies, especially for the functions like finance and consulting, etc.? There's a similar question. Uh, I think irrespective uh, of the I'm industry. Kiran, I think that's a similar question also. He is also asking, will the trends of work from home become a new part, new normal for the IT companies? I think um, working out of home and the IT industry is farthest probably 85 to 90 percent or more are working out of homes. But then when you poll some of the people in the IT industry who are working out of homes, especially the socializing and getting together to discuss some of the problems are definitely a challenge. And the pressure of working out of home without going out there, the family is uh, holed up together are all stresses one is really facing. So counseling is one of the choices that will be needed. As I said in my speech about the mental stress, I think people want to move. But then when you look at the traffic in a city like Bangalore, where each day you commute two hours, work from home has been a very, very welcome step. So I think it's a combination, like I said, but every industry is reinventing, whether it's the legal profession, the courts that are functioning, finance and accounting, audits, IT industry, health services we talked about. Across the board, we can find examples in every industry where working out of home is a reality. This is a question from Professor Krishnan. Uh, what, according to you, the industries are trying to do differently over what they have done in the so far uh, uh, very, during the various disasters? Oh, this is I think if you take, um, I'll take Tata Steel as an example. One is moving to emission standards by use of input resources, which are energy efficient is one of the things which they do so that the steel manufacturing and the way steel is going to be produced, the most energy efficiencies and least carbon uh, emission is going to be a way of life. And that is true for every industry. 
The second thing which I talked about is the ecological concern and the ecological well-being along with the economics, economics is what they do where all the communities around their operations are being revived, whether it is the uh, people around who work in the plant or outside and the health, etc. all the uh, livelihood needs are being met with. Third is with regard to the ecological sustainability in terms of whether planting trees or greening the whole environment. So I think every corporation is re-looking re -looking at its business model, see what we can shape. People like uh, Tata's or uh, Manikam, the example that was given the late uh, Manikam Ramaswamy, and when we visited the campus, the kind of greening, the kind of forethought he had on the sustainability itself, I think those are the examples we need to replicate, whether it's a small organization, medium enterprise, small enterprise, civil society, the ground level support, like some of the foundations I talked about are the large corporations. It must be in its ethos and the reporting transparently must be a way of life. The sustainability index is as important as the economic index or economic uh, results. This is the question from Dr. K. Silveraju. SIMA, South Indian Mills Association. Sri Manikam Ramasamy was true leader for Indian textiles and clothing industry and strongly advocating sustainability 360 degrees, especially effective utilization of human talents and adhering to social complaints. But the industry is facing acute crisis owing to high employee attrition. Kindly suggest few strategies for mitigating the same. And there are few of these which are really impacted during this COVID with loss of jobs, loss of livelihood. Textile industry is one where the weavers and their products are uh, the accumulated inventory. How do you distribute it? How do you sell it during these difficult times? How do you keep the employment? The arts and craft industry is another one which is suffering a lot, again, due to the same reasons. But there are a couple of organizations which have stepped up. I gave the example of the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastaru Sangrahalai Museum, where how do you restore the livelihoods of the upkeeping of the museum itself, production and maintaining of the museum objects. So I think there are a lot of civil society efforts, including the support of the corporations through the CSR mechanism, which are taking shape. There's an organization called Creative Dignity, which is a purely volunteer organization started in Bangalore, where they have connected with the artisans and artists of this country, including viewers, and the accumulated inventory, they have found it as close to 200 crores. We as members of that are advising them through the Amazon, the Facebooks, etc., to use that inventory and that the money proceeds goes to them for their well-being. So I think very, very creative ways of using the social platform, the digital platform, the corporate support, and the volunteering is what is sustaining, whether it is the viewers, whether it's the musicians, whether it's the arts and culture forms, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we have to learn from this example and scale it up as quickly as possible. But a number of efforts are underway, and we are closely monitoring some of these or participating in some of those. The distress is very palpable. Distress is very much there, and we cannot say that there's nothing. This is the question from Sri Madhavan Nambiar. Yes, sir. Yeah, please. And this is the question from Madhavan Nambiar. And yes, just for the sake of my students, I'm introducing Madhavan Nambiar. So he's a, a you know, former IAS officer. I know and him, sir. I know him. Uh, yeah, eminent public service. Yeah, uh, he's, he's also independent actor in several companies, including I also. Yeah. So his question is this: Environment, afforestation, agriculture are key issues uh, for skill development and jobs. How all this can be linked, and also the use of technology with your vast experience in all these areas? Could you give your views, please? Environment, afforestation, agriculture. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think uh, the fundamental point we have to keep at the back of our mind is how do we move from informal jobs to formal jobs? Take the employment situation in this country, close to 95% or more is in the informal sector. So the formation of the state skill development corporations, the national skill development corporation, 
which started as an autonomous body and then subsequently was folded into the Ministry of Skills, Entrepreneurship, Development. And he is setting up various, through the sector skill councils, curriculum to address some of these areas, and the certification to the level of competencies in these areas, which the corporates or the people who are in the sector will absorb as they graduate with these diplomas or certification programs. The new education policy, which has been announced, also touch upon the environmental, ecological needs, and the course curriculum will also become a part of that, both in the schools, colleges, and specialization in these areas through research and development. So various mechanisms to ensure the kind of jobs, which I also articulated as part of my talk, will become a reality and more we adopt that and more we look at it when we hire people, whether it is social scientists, whether it's public health specialists, whether it's environmental people or jobs in these sectors, along with the economic well-being of the institution is going to be the way forward. And that's the change we will all will see it in an accelerated manner. Today, corporates, when they ask for jobs, the candidates are asking them to what extent are they um, involved in sustainability. I don't want to work with a corporation which is polluting and is not taking care of the climate change. So I think the change in the model is very clear, both from the demand side as well as the supply side to make these things happen. Thank you, sir. Uh, so this is not a question. This is a text from uh, Devada, sir, to you. Sir, you had referred to reducing greenhouse gases by reducing waste generation and also mentioned about Tata Group's work in PPE to the frontline doctors as a part of CSR. Loyal is proud to have associated with the Tata Group in designing and manufacturing the PPE sets and manufactured in-house and supplied 55,000 sets of the design developed in collaboration with the Tata Group. Just he wanted to inform you. Sir. My compliments and congratulations to them. I think these are the models and they must be replicated because the need for these has not ended, it will not end, and the future pandemics will definitely need some of these preparedness. Unlike when the pandemic hit us, how do you move from importing the PPE kits from China to a manufacturing capability in the shortest possible time? The collaboration that emerged just now, what you articulated, and very similar ones, has become a way of life. For example, with CSIR and uh, Tata Consultancy Services, Tata Sons, a very, very uh, affordable um, testing kits have come into fruition and that is being launched very soon. I think there are a number of examples like this where multiple corporations have participated in the journey along with uh, various other organizations. The ecosystem itself is getting created as we speak. Thank you. This is a question from Mr. Nadraj. Sir, could you please elaborate on the interconnectedness between the sustainability and the climate change? I think... Um, Sustainability and climate change are interconnected very well. If we ignore climate change and say that it's not a reality, I think not only to start with the planet is at risk, but all of us as a humanity are at risk. So it's no longer going to be sustainable. And if you believe as part of the evolution, we are the last in the chain, that's a completely mistaken belief. To us, water sustainability and is too important with the kind of degradation to the contaminated water and the soil water. So I think we have to rejuvenate the water, reuse of water and sustainable water supply. And uh, every state, every district, every panchayat must focus on this. The devolution to that kind of a level is what will make a sustainable nation and a sustainable organization wherever it is present. I think mobility has to be relooked a number of initiatives in Chennai, for example, restoration of the lakes, or how do you look at transportation in the future so that you don't have to commute so much to do your job, etc., etc. I think everything is getting redefined, both in terms of climate change, carbon emissions, as well as a sustainable future. These are all interlinked in that way. Thank you. This is a question from Mr. Pranav. Uh, due to the COVID-19, the unorganized economy or unorganized sector is heavily impacted. There are a lot of jobless, uh, uh, which is not reported as well. So what's your take on it, sir? How will it recover? I think the beauty about our country is 
the philanthropy and the, su the support that we provide each of us as citizens in an affordable manner by cutting our own needs in terms of saving because I don't need that much and giving it to the people. Example, number of cities, the feeding that took place for the migrant workers, the feeding that takes place in the urban uh, problem affected areas and the number of organizations that I come up is absolutely something to speak of, which should become case studies in institutions like yours. I think these are some of the things which we must observe, watch, replicate and use that. The volunteering and financial support are the two key ingredients of sustainability, followed by the money that comes into this, which is pitched in by all of us, the institutions, philanthropy, CSR, the government and multinational bodies. I think that's the way it has to integrate that whole chain if we are to pour the money. Finally, the next generation of jobs for the youth because of the digitization, social platforms that are available where everybody has an equal opportunity, we must encourage that and every nook and corner of the country must be digitally connected without any haves and have nots. That's the way I feel about it. Two more questions. Uh, this is a question from Mr. Raja Gopalan from Australia. Considering the importance of sustainability, should India still engage in coal or gas-based gas power generation? I think coal is not going to go away easily because of the energy needs and the ramp-up that is required with the industrialization that is likely to take place. Clean coal technologies are the way forward for a foreseeable future and we must adapt that in every manufacturing plant which replaces the coal or uh, eliminates those uh, production processes must be monitored and must be seen very clearly. I think going away from coal will happen, but eliminating coal is not going to happen immediately. In spite of renewables, whether it is uh, hydropower, whether it is wind, whether it is solar. So I think we need to see that. Sir, you have any question? Gautam Sutar. Okay, this is the last question from Dr. Gopal. Uh, sir, according to recent economic times, uh, carbon emissions have come down by 17% due to this pandemic. Uh, so will there be any rebouncing because of this? Uh, so what is, what's your take on this? Sir? I think I mentioned again in the um, speech yeah. that the COVID has definitely put a break on the carbon emission across the world. But then once the vaccination is done, and COVID is, let's say, minimized or gone, we cannot afford to go back to the older ways of running corporations, running plants, running every one of our activities. If we are created the consciousness during this COVID period that we can do with less, we can emit less, we can measure our carbon emission very clearly, organizations are hell bent upon and the boards will be very accountable to make sure what is the kind of carbon footprint my organization is leaving. And the employees, like I said, will put a lot of pressure. The families will put a lot of pressure to make sure that the risk of the future is real, sustainability continuation uh, going away is real and these will bring in change in our behaviors. And I hope it brings in change in our behaviors. We had to look at ourselves, what kind of changes we brought during this period, whether it was for health, conservation of water, conservation of energy, etc., etc., or using clean energy for a sustainable world. And that's where the youth have a critical role to play. And that's my message to the youth. Be questioning of everything. Lead a life which is going to release and give you the least amount of carbon footprint. Ask for explanations, accountability, and data which is available in plenty should be disseminated for public good. These are the ways we can mitigate and change a new form of life to the new normal, not the existing old normal. Thank you, Sri S. Yes, Ramadri, sir, for an insightful speech. It's a pleasure interacting with you. Uh, I request Dr. Sel Lakshmi to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Uh, of profound gratitude to the esteemed chief guests of the day for gracing this occasion. We wish to thank uh, Sri S. Ramadurai for, for providing an opportunity for the young learners at TSN to listen to one of the best lectures uh, 
during their stint over here. This is going to be deterministic in the future as well. Uh, Sri S. Ramakura in his in a speech emphasized on the need to adopt to the new normal, which is going to be a new reality and it's also going to be a new normal. And he's pretty clear in clarifying that it is the world is unlikely to return to the world that it was. He emphasized on the need for the students to accelerate their efforts. While he addressed uh, or accepted that the, the, there had been a substantial reduction in emission due to the pandemic lockdown, the interventions for, for the future need to be tailored to the unique requirements and the involvement of the civil society and youth is mandatory. He also uh, emphasized on the importance of an interdisciplinary approach to food, energy, water, and health, etc. He had given several valuable inputs to the youth to address this. The need to approach this climate change and its problem, potential problems in a more informed way, youth education, and cultivation of international understanding among the youngsters, developing new habits and technology, and creating an awareness of what is hidden and preventing uh, the inevitable. He has valuable suggestions to the youth to make a smarter career choice in this field, develop interest in the rural entrepreneurship, use AI and machine learning to increase the efficiencies, volunteering to restore the planet, and also improve public accountability by raising voice against inappropriate behaviors. Uh, corporate, government, and so civil society must integrate ecology and economy, has been the sum and substance of his uh, advice to the youth. We would like to thank you, sir, for your valuable insights. We would like to thank uh, Ms. Radhika for the effective coordination. Our uh, thanks to Sri Venu Kopal, sir, for giving us warm reminiscences about the immortal qualities and virtues of our uh, late chairman. For those who have had the fortune of being with him, it brought in warm memories. And for those who have missed the fortune, it gave a uh, window to, the, to get to understand his noble and exemplary life. We wish to thank our chairman and the members of the board for initiating this annual event of uh, Manikam Ramaswamy Memorial Lecture. The whole event has been conceived and envisioned by our correspondent, Madam Shri. This is uh, Vali, Vali Ramaswamy, and our sincere thanks to her. The event has been ably executed by our faculty team and IT team, and my thanks to them. We wish to thank the members of academia, many of the industrialists, and several executives from corporates, including people from Lawyer Textiles, faculty and staff of our sister concern, including PCP and PS TMS for joining us on this occasion. I'm very sure that the young friends of TSM and the fellow participants will carry the memories uh, forever. To quote the words of Thiruvalluvar, uh, We are sure that the eminence and excellence of the legend Sri Manikam Ramaswamy will live on forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, lecture. We are uh, closing the event here.